respected teachers, senior colleagues, and my dear friends. At the outset, I should thank the entire organizing team of KISAKON 2021 for the, giving me an opportunity to express my views. So I don't have any conflict of interest, nor I don't have any financial support for this conference. So over the next few minutes, let, let us uh, dissect the topic. Let us see what is the existing lacunae and why a paradigm shift is needed in our day-to-day -day practice. And what is the problem with fasting? And what is the evidence of carbo loading in preoperative preparation? And what about giving carbohydrate loading in diabetic patients? And what is the strength, weakness, opportunities, and threat for this new concept? And is there anything beyond carbohydrates which we can adopt in our day-to-day -day practice? And let us conclude also. So why the tradition of preoperative fasting? Conventionally, we believe that by fasting the patient, we will be having a reduction in gastric acidity and volume, and it decreases the risk of vomiting and aspiration. But there is no evidence that a shortened fast of two to three hours for clear fluids increases the risk of aspiration or regurgitation compared to NPO overnight. And more than that, as we all know, the fasting the patient for a prolonged time can lead to unpleasant symptoms like thirst, hunger, anxiety, malaysia. And there is definitely increased incidence of postoperative nausea and vomiting, which can lead to electrolyte imbalances, hypovolemia, hemodynamic instability, decreased oxygen delivery, and cardiac output. And, and studies have shown that fasting the patient for a prolonged time can lead to insulin resistance. And in actual practice, we know that many of the patients are deprived of nutrition for 12 hours or more due to OT rescheduling or operating room delays. And patients are less thirsty, hungry, and anxious when not fasted. And traditional NPO practice was implemented to prevent aspiration, but was not supported by any evidence. Uh, so the problem of fasting is that it can produce insulin resistance, as I said before, which can persist for days or weeks and can lead to acute phase response and loss of lean body mass. And consequently, cell glucose uptake is reduced, glycogen formation halts, and liver and glycogen and muscle glycogen are depleted and hyperglycemia results from enhanced endogenous glucose production. And on top of that, inflammatory markers of surgical stress like cortisol, catecholamines, cytokines, and glucagon diminish the insulin action, which can further worsen the hyperglycemia in a fasting patient. So withholding nutrition prior to surgery increases the post-op complications and length of hospital stay. So this is what happens. The surgery itself produces stress response, which can reduce cytokines, catecholamines, and can finally results in hyperglycemia. On top of that, you are fasting the patient for a prolonged time, which can lead to insulin resistance and ultimately lead to hyperglycemia. So we have control over this fasting schedule and not on the surgery kit aspect and the inflammatory response. So what are the benefits of carbo loading? And studies have shown that it maximizes the glycogen stores to support gluconeogenic uh, process or, or the substrate throughout the surgery and it reduces the insulin resistance and tissue glycosylation and definitely helps in postoperative glucose control and reduction in postoperative opioid use and decreases the postoperative nausea length of hospital stay also. And it has been proved beneficial to faster, to faster return of bowel function, decreased the loss of muscle mass, and no increased risk of aspiration. The energy trial, which is that employing new enhanced recovery goals in bariatric surgery trials, which was released in 2019, so has shown that bariatric patients with the type 2 diabetic mellitus with the carbo load has significantly lower 30-day mortality, but they have used the sports drinks or juices. This is what they're used in the energy trial, like uh, uh, sports drinks or the ap apple or canberry or grape juice or orange juice, whatever it is. But in practice, we are not using. 
let us see the what is the quantity of carbo loading actually the quantity must be able to shift the body from a fasted to a fed state that is the principle and what we usually give is 50 grams of carbohydrate has been shown to produce a release of shown to produce a release of insulin similar to that seen after a mixed meal and 100 gram of carbohydrate the night before surgery and 50 gram close to two hours before surgery is what is being prescribed and what is the quantity of carbo loading is so what we usually give is 800 ml of 12.5 carb drink night before and 400 ml two hours before surgery the timing schedule is a bit different in different uh, protocols but this is what is being advised by the eras society and what is usually prescribed is complex carbohydrates like maltodextrin. And uh, actually, the American Society of Enhanced Recovery and Perioperative Quality Index, Quality Improvement Committee also recommends the same product, which has got a low osmolarity and clears through the stomachs in 90 minutes. This is a uh, very interesting article published in 2021 this year, uh, which addresses the pertinent question of can we give carbohydrate loading in diabetic patients? Let us uh, uh, actually dissect this uh, uh, journal. Uh, there are three crucial questions which has to be addressed. The first question is, does pre-op carb loading delays gastric emptying? And the summary from this article is, the employing carbohydrate containing beverages is similar between healthy controls and well-controlled in type 2 diabetes. But the question remains is patients with uncontrolled diabetes in type 2 or type 1 or in patients with gastroparesis, what should be the policy? The second crucial question is, does pre-op carb increases the risk of hyperglycemia? The summary in that uh, review is that intra-op and post-op blood glucose are not significantly different between patients with the type 2 diabetes who consume carb load and those who do not. But the question remains is, what is the optimal dose and timing of carb administration? And the third crucial question is, does the pre-op carb, uh, carb load increases the risk of periop complications? The summary from the article is that patients with the type 2 diabetes who receive carb loading have not been shown to have an increased risk of aspiration pneumonia, 30-day wound infections, and compared to those not receiving it. But the question remains, what about patients reported outcome like thirst, hunger, nausea in patients with diabetes, which is not explained in this review? And the role of ERAS protocol, does it also help in addition to the carb loading. That's also not uh, uh, clearly elucidated. Now, this is an another uh, interesting uh, review article which has uh, uh, analyzed so many uh, um, articles, formerly research uh, out outputs uh, concerning the uh, carb loading in diabetic patients, which was published in 2020. And their final outcome is a 400 ml of 12.5% carb load given 180 minutes before anesthesia is safe. You can continue that practice. And the peak glucose happens in 60 minutes. And they have found that no cancellation of cases due to increased blood sugar level. So what's the outcome? There is uh, no clear recommendation is given by IRA society SPAN, that is the European Society of uh, Parenteral or Enteral Nutrition Society, American Society of en uh, Enhanced Recovery Society or Perioperative Quality Improvement Committee. But they say that in case of severe diabetes, SPAN guidelines recommend avoidance of carb loading, especially in those with anticipated gastroparesis. So what is the strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats of this new concept? Strength is that it has shown that very clear-cut advantages along with ERAS protocol. So what is the weakness? We need further evidence to prescribe this in case of patients with diabetes, especially in patients with uncontrolled diabetes and patients with gastroparesis. 
and what is the opportunities at present it is uh, extensively studied in like uh, spe surgical specialties like gastro or obstructive practice whether the application in neuro or cardiac surgeries has to be clearly elucidated and the threat is that awareness among perioperative physicians, surgeons, and management has to be improved. So anything beyond carbohydrates, there are supplemental proteins like immune enhancing substances known as immunonutrition. And these are supposed to reduce the inflammatory markers, enhance immune response, and improve wound healing. And uh, the common agents, the targeted organs, targeted agents is uh, gamma-3 fatty acids, arginine, or nucleotides. But the results are mixed so that we cannot definitely come out with a recommendation. So the, in conclusion, the poor nutritional status can lead to suboptimal surgical outcome and a well-nourished patients experience better outcome in surgical procedure. The surgery of upper GA tract has unique challenge of imparting post-op intake because of extensive post-operative fasting. And the carbohydrate loading definitely attenuates post-op insulin resistance and decreases the protein breakdown. And carb loading is the key component of ERAS protocol. And it may be implemented in well-controlled type 2 diabetes mellitus without increased risk of hyperglycemia. But at present, there is no definite recommendation in poorly controlled type 2 diabetes mellitus or in patients with gastroparesis, especially by RAS or any other recognized bodies. And there is no clear cut case for immunonutrition. And there is strong justification for higher research on this topic. Thank you for patient listening.